Hello and welcome to the History of Chemistry in 15 Minutes. This is based on a little book I've been working on called The Mastery of Matter, masteryofmatter.com. You can check out a sample of it. I like to start uh, the history of chemistry in a uh, long time ago with the ancient Hittites. They were the, uh, the people who first separated iron from its ore. They lived about 1500 BC in the area of, uh, of modern day Turkey and Israel. And uh, this, is a, this is a stone relief from the Hittites uh, at a museum in Ankara. You can see they, they carve stone, of course, and carving stone is not chemistry. It's just manipulating, it's physically manipulating matter, uh, changing its shape and so forth. In chemistry, though, we're talking about chemically manipulating matter, changing its properties. And the Hittites were able to extract iron from its ore. This was not the first extraction of a metal from its ore. Uh, the Iron Age is after the Bronze Age, actually, so people were already extracting uh, copper and tin from its ore. But iron still used widely today. Uh, amazing development in technology. Let me just show you some little videos here of, um, of making iron. This is, uh, this is a video of the, the finding of bog iron, which is particularly interesting to me uh, as a soil scientist. Uh, these iron deposits that form naturally in wetlands. And uh, around here, there's in eastern Connecticut, there's a state park called Old Furnace, which is the site of uh, some old time uh, iron, bog iron mining and smelting. So uh, this is just a little video uh, showing a couple of guys that are looking for some some bog iron. They're poking in the in the peat bog here with with a stick, a metal rod, and here they find a big chunk of iron hydroxide. So you take a bunch of those, you, you grind them up, and of course there's other forms of iron ore as well. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the Hittites had. But then you put it in a furnace like this, and this is, a, this is kind of a reenactment here of uh, some, an ancient uh, iron smelting furnace. There's your iron ore mixed with charcoal. All right. Now you heat it up very hot in the furnace. They're adding a bunch of air to get it really hot here. Okay, they're getting it over a thousand degrees. And after a long time of, of cooking together with the charcoal, what happens is the, the oxygen is released from the iron oxide or hydroxide, and the oxygen is bound to the carbon as carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. And uh, what you get is a lump of metallic iron. Now here he is, he's about to remove what's called the bloom, which is kind of a spongy mass of iron uh, from this here. So he's taking out, he's digging in there, he's going to get out some of the slag, which is impurities. And there's the bloom there, a little round sponge, spongy or soft mass of iron. And you can uh, pound on it then, and here's some guys in a different video. Uh, they heated up a, a piece of bloom here, and they're going to start pounding it with hammers, just make it into a sword or a, or a plowshare, I guess, if you want. So you can start banging into whatever shape. You can, you can imagine the impact that a material like that had on, uh, on society. So that's chemistry, immensely practical, manipulating matter uh, for for our own use. And of course, um, iron was not the first use of chemistry. I, I consider glass making to be a form of chemistry. This is ancient Egyptian glass from, um, they were making glass as early as 1370 BC. And of course, uh, people have been using salt for uh, even long before that to preserve food. Um, and they still use it today. This, uh, now with refrigeration, it's not as common, but salt modifies the chemical environment of food so that it doesn't decay um, as, as quickly. It wasn't until the ancient Greeks, though, that people started really thinking about what matter was and how it worked. This is Democritus, the laughing philosopher, around 450 BC. Uh, he and his teacher uh, were, were expounding this theory that, that matter was made of atoms. In fact, they were true materialists. They believed that the only thing that existed in the universe was atoms and void. Very modern view, uh, very mechanistic about these atoms bouncing, in, bouncing into each other and... Uh, 
and combining and so forth and you know a sheet drying in the air and, and the atoms of water leaving it into the leaving the sheet into the air that was Democritus um, when Plato and Aristotle uh, had some different views this is a picture from a famous painting called the School of Athens Plato here is pointing up and uh, he is pointing to the universal principles he believed the only thing real was this world of ideal forms um, the rest of the world was not really real. Aristotle was a little more, you might say, down to earth, and here he is pointing down. Um, he believed that matter did exist, and that these ideal forms and principles or properties were imposed on matter. And depending on what property you imposed on matter, you actually got a different element. So, for example, if you impose the properties of wet and hot on matter, you get air. Hot and dry imposed on matter get fire and dry and cold make earth and cold and wet make water. One of the consequences of this is that you can transform things. You can transform one element into another, one substance into another. And um, so there's this kind of mutability, inherent mutability, or transmutation that is possible. This is an ancient al alchemical uh, manuscript. Alchemy comes from uh, an, an Egyptian, I mean not an Egyptian, an, an Arab word, alchemia. And, um, so it's like uh, the chemistry, you might say. This is uh, from a manuscript of Zosimus, an old alchemist. And they were able to do back, uh, I don't know, 300s, 400s AD, they were doing things like plating copper rings in silver. And uh, at first it seems like they knew they weren't really changing it, they were just adding something to it. Um, but this kind of changed when, when the alchemy melded together with, with Aristotelian theory. And uh, so the alchemists started to believe that they could actually change one metal into another. Um, and the Arabs brought this to Europe. And so you've got this kind of picture of the alchemist. This is a famous painting by Joseph Wright. Um, this picture of alchemists always trying to turn the base metals into gold. And they were looking for something called the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone was that substance that would be able to do that, to transform the base metals into gold. Uh, of course, some of these alchemists were nothing more than frauds. And uh, you see this in the Canterbury Tales, actually. Um, in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, he tells the story of an alchemist who basically uh, takes this guy for a ride and takes all his money by telling him he's going to teach him how to change mercury into silver. And, of course, he just fakes it and just takes the guy's money. Chaucer writes, Come forth, if it's a fool you'd like to be, and learn about the art of alchemy. If you have money, then step forward, sir, and you too can become philosopher. But it wasn't always fraud. Uh, the great physician and alchemist Paracelsus, um, he used chemistry for uh, to heal people. He used uh, antimony as a laxative and mercury to treat syphilis and, and other chemicals in his in his practice, so it was it was practical as well. Um, when we start to see this shift from alchemy is with Robert Boyle, who was sympathetic to alchemy, but he was clearly breaking from its kind of mystical and kind of uh, kind of nebulous nature. He uh, he came up with the first seemingly modern definition of elements that they are simple substances that can't be broken down into simpler substances. Um, and he was an atomist, by the way. He believed in atoms. So atoms did, uh, the at atomic theory was not gone until Dalton. It, it showed up um, at different times through history. And this is Robert Boyle. So in addition to his gas laws, he also um, developed the first kind of modern view of an element as a simple substance that can't be broken down into simpler ones. Uh, but alchemy uh, kind of hung on in the form of the theory of phlogiston. Uh, G. E. Stahl in the early 1700s came up with with the phlogiston theory of combustion. Now, in this, according to this theory, um, when you burn something, what happens is it releases this element called phlogiston, which is kind of a black, greasy element. And you can picture that black stuff that forms on like a pot over a campfire. Um, this is the reason I say this is kind of like alchemy is because it kind of harkens back to the element of fire, all right, and that same sort of thing. Interesting. Um, there are substances called calcs, and um, things like iron oxide would be considered a calx. Now, charcoal is almost pure phlogiston, so if you put phlogiston and iron oxide together and heat it up, what happens is the phlogiston goes back into the calx and makes the metal, the metallic iron. That's how the phlogiston theory would have explained the, uh, the smelting process. So it was actually a powerful theory in terms of, of explanation, but one of the problems it had is that when you burn metals with charcoal, or when you burn metals, um, 
even though supposedly they lose they lose phlogiston if you burn a, a pure metal it it supposedly loses phlogiston and yet it gains mass now they had all kinds of sort of ad hoc theories but the first guy who really um, kind of brought that problem to light and dealt with it was Antoine Lavoisier um, he was a tax collector in France he actually lost his head in the French Revolution um, after coming up with all his great theories but he came up with what's called the oxygen theory of combustion actually discovering oxygen according to uh, some historians and he came up with this idea that no there was this element in the air called oxygen so air was was actually a mixture of different elements and when you burn something like a metal what happened was the metal was combining with that oxygen to make a, a compound um, a gaseous compound in the case of carbon and in the case of a metal uh, the reason the metal got hot it got heavier when you heated it was because it was combining with another element and I think um, he's he's called Lavoisier is called the father of modern chemistry, and I think it's because really with Lavoisier we first have this picture of chemicals, uh, elements combining and breaking apart from each other and recombining and different to form different um, compounds in a quantitative way. Lavoisier used um, made heavy use of the analytical balance. He wasn't the first one uh, to use a balance, but he he did make heavy use of it and the conservation of matter the principle of the conservation of matter that matter is neither um, created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction that it's just changed from one form into another and actually it's just atoms of different elements um, combining and, and making different combinations this is just a picture of uh, Lavoisier's uh, analytical balance very sensitive balance that he used there were people um, who resisted this but but Lavoisier really by the time he was done with his theory we basically had this modern uh, picture this modern scheme of matter classification of matter matter can be divided into mixtures and pure substances uh, mixtures can be separated physically and then pure substances can be either compounds or elements and compounds can only be separated chemically all right and we can get into a little more detail here um, and we will um, but for now this is so this is this is modern chemistry is when we have this kind of paradigm of matter not everybody um, switched from the phlogiston theory so easily joseph Priestley was a brilliant scientist um, he actually invented the carbonated beverage uh, discovering co2 figuring out how to put it into water and make uh, carbonated water and that's among many things that he did actually some of his experiments uh, were were borrowed by Lavoisier and reinterpreted and that's how Lavoisier discovered uh, some of his stuff so uh, Priestley was brilliant but he held on to the phlogiston theory he would not um, change his view of of combustion and so he got kind of got stuck in the past but um, again he he made some great contributions the um, carbonation of water is was uh, one of my favorites I just love seltzer water I got this new soda stream uh, that I use all the time uh, to, to make myself seltzer water but the revolution created by by Lavoisier is one of the examples that that Thomas Kuhn uses in his book the structure of scientific revolutions as a major paradigm shift what happens is uh, normal in normal science nobody really questions the underlying theories the the so-called laws for a while and what happens is anomalies start to crop up and they start to persist um, in this case it was some anomalies related to phlogiston theory about uh, the gaining of mass by metals and and so forth and then some young scientist uh, usually a young scientist or someone from outside um, the field they start to pick up on this and question this and they challenge it and they don't have these kind of deep set notions that are stuck in their minds they haven't been working their whole lives on this theory so they don't have this kind of vested interest they're willing to question it to challenge it and that's what Lavoisier did and then what happens is when they come up with a better theory a better theory a better worldview a better picture of the world that actually works better and fits the data better then the paradigm shifts is this a duck or a rabbit kind of depends on your perspective and in this case you can look at it and you can kind of switch in your mind back and forth before the between the two but in a true paradigm shift once you switch once your worldview changes you look at the world differently and you can't see it the same way again and that's what happened in Lavoisier's time 
and we'll move on and further in chemistry in our next issue.